Welcome. This is, uh, I'm, oh, I'm Jim Milliken, Chair of the Concord Historical Society, and I'm really pleased you're here. And this is interesting. This is our first time with the program in, in the house. And I understand that they're also running kind of a comparable program about the history of the building. And I'm, I'm not prepared to tell you the details because I don't know them, but I think they were in the monitor this past week. And that may even be the reason a few folks showed up at 6.30. <laughs> and it says seven on our thing, but I think the 6.30 thing might be every Thursday or every Wednesday at 6.30. Does that sound right? It says about from March 14th on, so I guess. That's the, that's the house. That's the yeah. house, okay. And um, I've had the, I'm getting off track a little, but it's fun. Uh, I've been through the whole house myself. It is absolutely a fascinating place. And the last person to live here was Carolyn Jenkins. Um, and she, when, when she passed, she left the house to a number of community organizations. And many of us have been able to take advantage of it. Concord Historical Society was not one of them, but we have the relationship with the folks here, and there, and we've really got a wonderful marriage. Our office, which is not a public office, but is on the second floor, and we have some fascinating uh, archival materials and so forth. But that's for another night. And um, but we're really fortunate to be here, and the relationship is excellent. About the house, I, I noticed they put a little bit of information here about the house. And I saw this band or something in the picture back here. I don't know what that is, but as you wander through the house, you're going to see some really neat things. Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate to look up at the ceilings in each one of them. Mm -hmm. See, I am getting carried away. <laughs> it's a fascinating place. And I know that when Carolyn was here, and one of the times I was able to be here, before she passed, the entire basement was a dollhouse. Mm. Mm. Am amazing downstairs. Now, and lastly, but if you go up in the attic, have you ever heard about a, a, a ship, the, how they build the ceilings in some of the old houses? Like the, that's, oh my gosh, when you come back for that, it's beautiful upstairs. So. I'll let it go with that. I hope I've got you interested now, because that's great. Jim, there are um, archi oh my God. Oh. architectural drawings throughout the downstairs here yeah, we um, saw that it. are of the house. Yep. If people wanted to walk around after our presentation and look at that on the ground floor here, they can do that. I'm, dis I'm discouraging you or even saying don't. It would, not be, it would not be appropriate to go upstairs and wander through the, the folks up there. There are several folks who are actually renting space here. Um, Gary Sampson is one of them, if you happen to know that name. One of the books we have on sale out here is from uh, Gary Sampson and uh, Liz, Liz, Liz Hengen. And it's all about down Main Street Concord and the history of uh, all the buildings. So. Uh, and there's also a nice donation jar out there. It's really <laughs> <laughs> we need to certainly take a look at that jar. <laughs> so, donation jar. Oh, yeah. And I'm willing to take questions too, but RP is, you, this is terrific that we got RP Hale to come be with us. Normally I say, uh, where are the bathrooms? And uh, over at the carriage house, they're just around the corner. And in this building, there's none on the first floor, except for these two. <laughs> and uh, you have no permission to use them. <laughs> there is a bathroom in this, on the second floor, but let's hope you don't need it. If you do, we'll show you where it is. Jennifer? I was going to say I would, I would assist in that regard. OK. So uh, the Concord Historical Society has been around uh, about 20 years now, and we've uh, been doing our very best to make sure Concord history doesn't get lost in the shuffle. We have an absolutely beautiful <coughs> New Hampshire Historical <coughs> Society right behind the State House. The State House itself is a historical place, and I mean, if you live in Concord or come and visit, 
it's a really great place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to make sure some of the local stuff doesn't get lost. Mm -hmm. And what we have right here in front of us is one of two uh, Prescott organs that were built in Concord back in the early, eight, eight, say, 1800, 1835, I think they started. But I'm not going to take R.P.'s thunder here. He'll tell you a lot more about it. And you're going to even be luckier to hear him play it. Which, and uh, R.P., he said, I'll oh, just call me R.P. and I'll come and sit down. Uh, but if I get started on telling you about R.P., we'll never stop. That's right. But uh, R.P. came to Concord about 50 years ago. And he introduced himself as a wagon builder to me when I first met him. And you've just seen all the many things that he's done since, including building, uh, oh my gosh, uh, what do we call them? Harpsichords. 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 A what? Harpsichords. Well, harpsichords, no, it's got another Dulcimer. name. Dulcimers. Dulcimers? Yes. Dulcimers. Yeah. So once you get him here, take advantage of all of his knowledge. So I'm a, I couldn't introduce him any better than that, I guess. Oh, that I'd be doing it most of the evening. He's a tremendous asset to our community and, uh, and a good friend. So, any questions before I turn it over? Say none. RP, yeah, come out of the woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want. Help me welcome RP. Would you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. God, all this stuff I've got to live up to now. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, the reason I moved here was because my late wife told me, because I was living in Arizona. Then, I, then in 1980, I came here and spent four months in New Hampshire. Then I went back. <laughs> then I came back, and I spent six months in New Hampshire with her. And then I went back. And then in 1981, I came for the third time, and this time, I intended to spend five months, but she kept extending. <laughs> and finally, and, she, and I started to figure, okay, she is up to something. She finally said, you leave, that's it. Knowing I was never going to be that lucky again, I stayed. And um, we had a 43-year odyssey. So, um, and, um, and the first thing I, so I came, she came home, she was an electrician, she came home, and I said, go look at the truck. Oh, it looks like your truck. I said, go look. She came back. You did it! Because I put those loop free and die plates on there. That's what I did. <laughs> and, and I said, I did that today, and I got my new driver's license, and then the first thing I did was to go to the Concord Public Library and get a library card and check out the thickest books I could find on New Hampshire and the city of Concord and Merrimack County, because if I'm going to live here, I want to know where, what I'm doing here. <laughs> and it turned out there were See, being a harpsichordist, there are a lot of things you can do in Tucson, but that's not one of them. You can do that here. And so I got, there was lots of work for harpsichordists and calligraphers and strange people like me, and I ended up really enjoying it. I'm not leaving, sorry, you stuck with me. I am uh, currently a teacher of chemistry at um, Pembroke Academy. Yay, public schools. Um, and I'm also, I was shanghai in October to become the new organist at St. Paul's Church after a 22-year absence. So, and, yeah, there was a little bit of collusion between John Spring and Father Dennis Brunel on that one. And when I heard it was, when I heard um, that they were over there, I knew immediately who was involved, so. Okay, so that church hired an Aztec organist, and that church is you're going to have to live with it now. <laughs> I've been told by students at school and parishioners, you have too much fun at your job. <laughs> well, that's the idea, isn't it? So, um, I uh, was able, uh, there's kind of a dearth of information on uh, the Prescott family. I mean, everybody knows about them, but there's not a whole lot of information there. See, see, the city directory, they will give you the name, the address, and the owner, and maybe a few other things. In Tucson, they want to know everything. And um, maybe it's that New England laconic <laughs> attitude versus us voluble Mexicans. So, I mean, uh, 
yeah, you're, you know, two Mexicans in the same room will give you three opinions. <laughs> and, um, and even one Mexican in a room will give you more than one opinion. Just ask my students. And um, so we're, we have, we're dealing with the Prescott, Oregon here, built in 1850. The other thing about being a harpsichordist is I get these way cool jobs playing in historic sites, playing with historic instruments. I mean, I was in fourth grade looking at a picture of the Paul Revere House in Boston. I'm in Tucson. Will I ever go there? I've been working with them for 25 years now. I'm their one, count it, one 1740s reenactor. <laughs> because everybody's a rebel. And I didn't want to be one. For one thing, the clothing was horrible and very uncomfortable. <laughs> 1740s just hangs off of you. You're comfortable. You are not strangled by your neckcloth. I mean, and plus I'm a cultural reenactor, which means those people are in demand. Museums fight for us. <laughs> they pay to. I mean, if they have the money, right? So the Prescott Organ Company did not begin as such. It began with an instrument maker from Deerfield named uh, Abraham, I hope you forgive me on using notes. I had a long name class today, <laughs> which culminated with an hour and a half of teaching Holocaust, which always takes that out of me. Oh, yes, I'm both a chemistry teacher and a Holocaust educator, and um, I came home really subdued, and one of my particular friends came over to hang out for a while, and that kind of brought me back up. And I knew I had to come back up for this presentation. So at any rate, so uh, there was one Abraham Prescott living in Deerfield. He was a viol maker. That, the, the bass viol is one of these six-foot instruments. And, I, and the Congregationalist churches loved them. It was the one instrument they allowed. I figure, oh, and I'm thinking, well, the thing looks like an overgrown fiddle. And I'm thinking, maybe they liked it because you couldn't tuck this thing under your chin and play it like a fiddle. <laughs> And it's got bass notes. Now, since I'm an accompanist, the more bass notes I have, the more I like it. Hello, 32-foot organ stop at church. And, um, and the bass pipes really are that big. So, um, and, uh, so he's building bass files, and then he moves to Concord, and uh, we do know he was supplying the congregational churches with bass files, and I think there is one of them at the Historical Society, at the New Hampshire Historical Society. Um, I'll have to look, I think it's one of his, I'll have to look, I want to know the provenance of that instrument anyway. So um, then, uh, then, then he moved to Concord in 1831. So in 1811, we first hear about him setting up a business in Deerfield. And his first bass viol went to the Deerfield Congregational Church, that's the end of that year. And then for some reason he moved, decided he wanted to live in Concord, so he moves here. And he's building bass viols through 1831. We do know that First Church, South Congregational didn't exist then. First Church had one. This was before they got real and brought organ, the organ back into the sanctuary. And then, then 1845, his son Abraham Jr., or Abraham J., not Jr., um, was old enough. He joins the firm, and it becomes uh, Abraham Prescott and Son, still building base files. However, in 18, by 1836, he's added melodians. This is a melodian, a parlor organ, a reed organ, a pump organ. It is not a pipe organ. I'll go into a little bit of the physics, which is really fascinating, because I'm kind of rehearsing for a presentation at school in a couple of weeks. They're talking about sound. Hey, we got a harpsichordist two doors down. You should bring him in. Get away from me! <laughs> and. Uh, no, I'd rather talk about stoichiometry and chemical reactions. You want me to talk about this stuff again? I mean, come on. So, um, so 1845, it becomes Abraham Prescott and Son. Then 1850, Abraham Sr. retires. I mean, you know, he'd been at it since 1811. I mean, 39, you know, almost 40 years. And remember, this is an era where your average lifespan was your late 30s, early 40s. I mean. If you ever take a look at Old North Cemetery, you're going to see a lot of infant graves, you know, through five or ten years. Then it's going to start dropping off a little bit. Then you'll see the women's toll rise. Well, childbed fever, childbirth. And then it'll fall off in the late 20s. And then you're not going to see a whole lot of 30, 40 year olds. And then you'll see a slight rise in 50 year olds. 
and then you'll see a rise in 60, and there's a lot of 80-year-olds over there. So if you can make it past your 40th year, you are going to be tough enough to get another 40 years. And, I mean, you've survived everything, you know, smallpox, diphtheria, waterborne disease, getting kicked by horses, who knows what all. I mean, that romantic time wasn't. There are too many ways of getting knocked off early. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, germ theory did not exist. So, um, and cleanliness was not as important then as it is now. So, um, 18, so 1850. And uh, so uh, Abraham, the, Abraham the Younger takes over, Abraham J. And uh, Abraham Sr.'s other two sons, Josiah and Joseph, joined. And the firm became renamed as Prescott and Brothers. <laughs> Prescott, of course, being Abraham Jr. And, um, and then the brothers, oh, well, they're just sort of there. And, but we know who was really running the firm, right? And it was initially located at Three Merchant exchange on the second floor. All right, now, help, can anyone tell me where the Merchants Exchange building was or is or whatever? I'm going to have to, I, I just bought the Concord uh, photo book. I'm going to find out in there and I'll call, and I'll, I'll call, I'll call Jim Milligan at two in the morning and tell him I found it. I believe it's where um, the draft is today, that is 67 South Main Street, okay. where Concord Beef and Seafood is, that strip mall there is right. 75, uh -huh. and Merchant's Block was 71 South okay. Main Street, so it's in between in a space that no longer exists. Yeah, that it slope. Burned, it burned down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the factory did burn down in the 1890s. And um, so um, 1853, well... It wasn't Prescott and Brothers for very long. I mean, it was for three years, because in 1853, um, J.W. resigned, Josiah, and because he wanted to go off and build his own, do his own thing, building melodians, you know, and become a competitor. And uh, you can imagine, can you imagine the family rift when that happened? And, um, and I'm looking at some of these histories, I'm thinking, my God, the family fights in the barrio were nothing compared to what I'm reading here. I mean, we Mexicans don't know how to fight. I mean, good thing we never learned from New Englanders. <laughs> and uh, 1857, Josiah passed away. Okay. Uh, the youngest brother, George D.B. joins. So uh, Josiah was uh, kind of replaced quickly. And that was in 1871, not replaced quickly. Um, 1881, uh, 1871 was also the same year. It was renamed the Prescott Organ Company. They were no longer, they had long since quit making vials. They were now into parlor organs. And um, then uh, 1881, 10 years later, the firm was incorporated, formally incorporated. And uh, now they got protection. They also have to uh, answer to investors now. And uh, then their, their quality has to go way, way up. And I mean, it was already pretty high. They were very famous for the quality of the instruments as evinced by the fact we're looking at one that still works and um, is in excellent shape for its age. I mean, this one dates 1850. I mean, just think about it, 11 years for the Civil War. And I um, know I wasn't around then. Um, since I'm a 1740s reenactor, I had passed away around 1810. So, <laughs> never met the guy. And, um, and then uh, 1886, they started a new line. They started making what they call piano fortes, these square pianos and that you still see. And by the way, if you have one or know of one, never, ever, ever ask to have it tuned to modern pitch because you will break the strings. They are not scaled to modern pitch. They are scaled not to A, but to A flat. Mm -hmm. The Baroque A at 415 cycles per second. That's what those strings are scaled for. And I've been able to retune quite a few of them with their original string setups at that pitch without breaking anything. Um, if I'm tuning and there's several breaking, then I'll have to say, you know, we've got to replace all these because you lose two, then there's going to be four, and then there's going to be eight, and you can see the geometric progression happening here, and you finally will have a piano that you want to turn into a desk because it doesn't work anymore. So get those new strings. There, you can find, you can get them. 
So uh, let's see what happens. 1887, it's now renamed the Prescott Piano and Organ Company. Um, the organs, uh, the pianos are becoming the big thing. The parlor organ was starting to lose its uh, dominance. And uh, the pianos were, were becoming the thing. I mean, it's kind of hard to play <coughs> Liszt and Wagner on a, on a parlor organ, not that I personally want to, but you know, that was, that was the thing then. Uh, big, loud, pounding, and you can't pound these instruments either, you'll break them. Whereas the pianos, they were made to hit. <laughs> Which is why I, as a harpsichordist, will let a pianist look at my instruments, but thou mayest not touch. I learned that one the hard way. Same for the St. Paul's organ. If you are a pounding pianist, you will not be allowed within 10 feet of those keyboards. Because some churches you'll see sagging keyboards. Do you know how much it costs to get those repaired? Uh uh. Deal with it proactively by not allowing that to happen. That comes from hitting. Okay, so Prescott, so 1881, it's now the Prescott Organ and Piano, uh, Piano and Organ Company. You can see which one was dominating. Um, 1891, 10 years later, organ production ended. And then it was renamed once more the Prescott Piano Company. And uh, it was at 71 Main, uh, South Main Street, the factory, which uh, between, you know, that, that, that little strip mall, and you see that, that slope between them and the next building, north, that's where it was. I've, yeah, getting that information, that kind of triggered something. Oh, I do remember after all. Okay. Maybe I'm not too old for this yet. <laughs> and the showroom was at 92 North Main. So in other words, uh, I guess they got tired of uh, always having to clean sawdust off the, <laughs> off the new piano. So let's, let's get them out of there and up here and we'll have a clean room and people don't have to play the instruments and sneeze in the sawdust. 1896 though, calamity. The factory caught fire and burned to the ground. Wooden building full of uh, lumber and stock things. Fire department couldn't do a thing about it. They tried. I mean, I understand the fire lasted for half a day. And the fire department, of course, the technology they had that was not equal to the fire they had to deal with. And even though there were something, you know, they were starting to ask for horse drawings from the other town. Yeah, Bo sent one. And I think Hopkinton even sent one. It got there too late. But it was still, the fire was still too much for the existing fire technology. 1912, the year Arizona became a state, also saw the year that the business went out. And this was a pioneering business, so they, uh, so they were basically from 1835 to 1912. And they were pioneers in <coughs> instrument making, uh, primarily for parlor organs, reed organs. Any questions? I mean, this, the information is kind of scant, and I kind of hated putting it in chronological form, which is something I never did in history class. Uh, I like timelines, but I like timelines to have several parallels, you know, the meanwhiles, because nothing happens in a vacuum. Yeah, read about Gettysburg. Everybody knows about Gettysburg, right? Did you know that Vicksburg was happening at the same time? Plus one of Stoneman's raids, plus Abraham Lincoln, um, doing his thing up, up north, and General Sherman starting to plan his devilment, and all that stuff happening on those same July days. So, uh, now what I brought in, since I'm a wood engraver, I, I like to collect original works. And so I collect Harper's Weeklies, mm -hmm. Harper's Monthlies. Mm -hmm. And these were illustrated by wood engravings. I, and I steal, I mean, use a lot of technique that I see being done. However, they also had advertisements, and one of them, this is a May 1865, and one of them, there's a, pia uh, a piano forte. This is basically what, um, I mean, there were different styles, but this is basically what Prescott was building, these square pianos that you still see around. Uh, the New Hampshire Historical Society is two of them. One of them still works, and I got to play it. And there's something about the word harpsichordist. I, I think it inspires a level of trust that I otherwise <laughs> wouldn't get. Hey, he's weird. We can probably trust him. Um, 
And of course, this looks very much like the one under the stairs. Mm -hmm. Automatic organ. <laughs> what that meant is that it, uh, the wind, you had to pump it. You had the bicycle it whilst playing. No pedal board, sorry. Or good, depending on your outlook. But you had to pump this thing, so you got your exercise. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the wind was automatically sent through the reeds. That's what it meant. And um, school organs and melodions. A melodion is a small parlor organ. Kind of like uh, a melodion, uh, an example of a melodion is what you see uh, ensembles from India playing. The little box, uh, the little box, which is about so big by so wide, and you know, three octaves, and you play it one-handed, you play it either left or right-handed, whilst your other hand is reaching around the back and keeping the bellows going. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, they, uh, they came out of Europe, and they very quickly entered the repertory of India. And because uh, there's something about a drone that just lends itself to uh, music from all parts of India. Here's another slightly different cabriolet pianoforte. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you can get one of these for uh, 350 bucks. Mm -hmm. 350 1865 mm -hmm. dollars, which yeah. is considerably, I mean, modern pianos, if you updated the price, cost less. So uh, um, this was a year's wage to a, to a uh, blue collar worker. Mm. So you're not going to, uh, they were kind of like harpsichords. Not everybody could own one or be owned by one. Um, and the organs were, were a little more affordable. So there were many more of these in Concord homes because you'd pay maybe 125, which is still a big chunk of change in 1850. <laughs> But it was much more affordable. And people liked the sound of the organ. It reminded them, you could play anything you want. And, um, and by the way, these instruments, be it organ or pianoforte, they were used heavily. We had a lot of singing societies here. And you know the Messiah thing that happens every year here? Mm -hmm. Most of those groups in the, in the 19th century were doing those, all independently. I mean, you could, horse through Concord, and you'd hear one coming from here, and somebody singing, I know my Redeemer liveth over there, and you hear in the Hallelujah Chorus <laughs> over there, and St. Paul's Church is cranking it up, and, and First Church, is, of course, is going to the, to, with a vial. And, um, and they, uh, these things, I mean, that was your entertainment. Singing, dancing, socializing, no TV, no internet, no radio. So you got your fun where you could get it. And consequently, I'm going to say this, we were much more socially oriented then because we did not have our distractions now. <laughs> Telling my kids, okay, attendance is done, cell phones, stow them. <laughs> That's painful for them. <laughs> I said, I will not have your cell phones competing with the assignment you're going to be doing. So, Now, the physics um, is really interesting. First off, uh, these are called read or free read organs. There are no pipes in these. I mean, it's operated by wind pressure. But unlike South Church, First Church, St. Paul's, um, there are no pipes in here. And you have to operate uh, no pedal board. You have to start. If you want wind to go through the reeds, you've got to do this. And you, can't, you can neither do it too fast nor too slow. So I was testing the organ. I found out that pressing that down about once every two seconds was about the right pressure. Too much, you're going to get squeaking or squawking. Too little, you're going to lose pitch. And if, you're, if I have Holly Tepe in here and she say, why is that A and A flat? <laughs> oh, I should pump harder. So, uh, um, so the physics is you have, what you have is a metal plate. And this organ apparently has maybe three of them. Three, we call them stops, but there are no stop levers because there's only one setting of sound. I looked, and um, but that's okay. Um, never look at it as a limitation. Look at it as to what you can get away with. <laughs> you know, I have a virginal that I built, a small harpsichord, 49 notes. Keyboard's that long. Whatever can you do with that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Elizabethan virginal music, some of the nasty stuff ever written. That's what I can do on it. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm limited. And um, so, so there's... There, 
There are sets, there, in this I think there are three sets of metal plates, each with a se series of holes in them. Each metal plate has a concurrent plate. I mean, if this were a stop organ, there would be a second plate that would cover the holes when you didn't want to hear those particular reeds. It's kind of like an accordion. And so these are permanently open because there's no need to change the sound. There's, there's no way of changing the sound either unless I reach in and steal one of the plates. So the air at each one of those holes has to its right side a metal strip that's attached to that metal frame. And the air goes past and it sets up a sympathetic vibration, which in turn generates sound waves. And the frequency of that vibration, the more it vibrates, and the smaller the reed, the higher the pitch. So the windows for the treble notes are going to be little, the windows for the bass notes are going to be large, and those reeds are going to be thick. And that's also why you'll hear kind of a grating sound in the bass. I mean, we'll play a treble note here. Sounds pretty even, doesn't it? You hear that rumble? You you're, are actually hearing the frequency of every single one of the flapping of that reed. And so it's flapping at probably, you know, ten times, you know, six to ten times a second. I mean, if I had an oscilloscope, I forgot to steal one from the physics department. Um, we could show it. And uh, in fact, I will be bringing the dulcimer in there to just show exactly that to them. So, um, what kind of music? Well, we're talking 1811. Let's talk 1811 to 1890. Um, I don't want to talk about the factory burning, so we're not going. Uh, I'm not going to 1891. What kind of music was being played? Well, what was happening back then? Well, 1811 was before the War of 1812, which lasted to 1815, and then you had this long period. The antebellum period, which started after that, and where southerners were kind of the southern states were holding the rest of the country hostage to their views, but overall up here in Concord, things are going pretty good in the first half of the 19th century. Well, 1850, things start hotting up. You know, it's uh, you know nobody would say it, but there was going to be a conflict sooner or later over what was going on, and. Uh, <clears throat> And then we have the war years, 18, basically 1860 to 1865. The war proper started in 1861. And then Reconstruction, and then we have the good times of the 1870s, followed by the panic, then recovery in the 1880s, followed by another panic, and then the 1890s, things got going. What put an end to the, what put, uh, the 1890s was the Gilded Age, the age of the, um, Robber barons. What put an end to that era? 1912. Uh, the sinking of the Titanic would normally have been a minor affair, except for the fact it had all these industrialists aboard. And it was also a ship on its maiden voyage. It was the last word in construction and safety, and it didn't make it through its first voyage. And what put the nails in that coffin was what happened in August 1914, the beginning of World War I, which ended the Gilded Age and the uh, Prosperity Age. So, uh, and brought us into the brutalities of the modern era. So the kind of music, early on you were going to hear a lot of hymns. And uh, popular music was going to be uh, people like Mendelssohn, Schubert. Uh, Handel was amazingly popular. Bach was not. He was ignored. Mendelssohn brought Bach back, but when Mendelssohn died too young, he took Bach with him. And then you started in the 1830s and 40s, you got the rise of Chopin and Liszt. <laughs> and then you get the German group, the neo-German group in the 1850s and 60s. Pianos had to be bigger and heavier and louder and longer so that these guys could hit it, make big sounds and not destroy the keyboard. Which they you ever seen a Russian pianist play? <laughs> they start up here. I have seen them. And Alice and I were watching one, and she said, What could he do to your harpsichord? And I said, Shut up, don't even mention that. I don't want to even think about it. Don't do that to me. <laughs> and um, so I mean this was that was the 
the over-emoting, over-demonstrative piano era. And um, 1860s, this country, all of a sudden, it's all civil war. National tunes, patriotic tunes, and uh, with some of which I'll play. Uh, you were also going to hear some shaker music around here because of the heavy influence of Canterbury, some of whose hymns found their way into the general hymnody. Simple Gifts is the most hacking one of them all. But there are other hymns that I have traced, one in the Episcopal Hymn Book to the Canterbury Shakers. And um, then there was, um, then after that, now we're coming into the 1870s, we're getting, we're going back to popular music, dances were very, dances were very big the whole time, the whole era. And on it goes. So I'm going to kind of, maybe I should do that, I'll, I'll do this chronologically. Um, so basically, this is a reed instrument, it works like a harmonica. You blow through it, reeds will vibrate it, and there's where you get your sound. And bigger reeds at the bottom, bigger reeds and bigger windows at the bottom. Smaller reeds, smaller windows at the top. And these are tuned at the factory. If they fell out, you would have to bring it back, and they would have to open the case and rework it. But, it would, but tuning was usually, you're good for several years. Unlike pianos and especially harpsichords. <coughs> yeah, you, you spend 90% of your tuning and you spend the remaining time playing off tune anyway. So, um, let's see, we'll start with something. I'll start with a, an air by Schubert. I mean, uh, it, was, it was very popular. I don't know if it was actually played here in Concord, but I'd be very surprised if it hadn't been. And uh, Schubert lent himself to a uh, uh, forte pianos and early uh, melodias, and um, a lot of his German airs, leader, were translated into English. So. Um <laughs> until you actually do it and embarrass yourself in front of an audience. <laughs> pattern. That's uh, so D major, G major, D major, E minor, D major, A, F sharp minor, D. So the numbers represent the, uh, the, the chord pattern that was used. So, so a lot of his music, early music followed that particular pattern because it was so singable. Yes? You mentioned that it was like a harmonica, but I'm thinking that in a harmonica, if you blow out, you get a different note than if you Inhale and, yeah. and this they have yeah they have two reeds going opposite to each other. Oh, so when you okay. inhale, you're going to hear one, and when you exhale, you'll hear the other. But this you're getting the same note. What yeah, the, the air is only going in one direction. Okay. And um, um, if it went back and forth, you'd hear ah 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 ah, and it would, you'd hear the interruption. It's so really it just harsh. it just wouldn't work. Yeah. And I understand that was tried. Um, in Germany, and there was no way they could regulate the air to keep it moving during the back and forth. And furthermore, reeds would tend to really go out because you now have a very fragile setup, which meant more time back at the factory being retuned. Finally, just rip the extra set out, and you're just going to go in one direction. So, um, thank you. I was um, oh, yeah. Over that. 
Yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions. If I know the answer, I'll give it to you. If I don't know it, I'll say, you'll know, say, I don't know. And um, so, uh, so all the way through the 1820s, Handel was incredibly popular. For some reason, he was the only Baroque composer who never lost popularity throughout the entire era. Mozart was the second one. But everyone else fell by the wayside, and many of them were not to be rediscovered until the revival of the 1960s. And Bach, he was relegated to the piano, which is the instrument he never worked out on. So Handel, this from the, and we do know that of all the Messiah sings, there are a lot of letters from the era. They mention that one of the favorite arias was, I know my Redeemer liveth. I'm going to play part of it here, which, by the way, I also have to do on Easter. So I may as well practice now, right? <laughs> changes the melody, the accompanist does not get that, well, I take the privilege anyway, uh, so I don't fall asleep at the keyboard, but uh, it is a lovely aria, and it is mentioned frequently, and, you know, we went to a Messiah sing in Main Street, and, and um, uh, my favorite piece was, I know my redeemer lives, so we have, I've been able to recreate entire concerts in the period from diaries. We created one, recreated one at the Governor Wentworth Mansion from 1744 from two letters of the period. And I found 90% of the music. And being asked to recreate the first service at St. Paul's Church 200 years ago, well, they had no records, but you know who did? Old North in Boston and St. John's in Portsmouth. And what were they playing in 1830? That's where I took it from, and I took, I took this hymn list, and I found out, oh my God, they're all in the 1982 hymn book. <laughs> How many times are you going to luck out like that? <laughs> Damn right I took it. So, <laughs> and so we recreated that service. The only thing, and the Evensong service is unchanged from the, 18, uh, from the 1789 version, except in spelling. And so that was the first service that was done, so we recreated it. And the only th major difference was that there was a, a full-on Anglican chant in the middle that only five of us could do. <laughs> um, yeah, um, more and more Episcopal churches are relearning that art. I think it had, personally, I like it. It has a liturgy, plus it's more music. All right, so, um, so Handel, I mean, you would have heard this all the way through the 1890s. You would have heard it last December. And there are actually still a lot of private handle things going on in December. And um, so uh, he, ne he never lost it. And Mozart, oh, Mozart arias, uh, be they sacred or secular, they were very popular. And... Um, and uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. 
you would hear that. And um, then, um, so the 1830s, now we're getting into more sentimental pieces. This is the early Victorian age. Uh, love songs were very popular. Uh, airs. Um, love poems set to music by local composers, of which I know a very little bit. I mean, it didn't survive. And, you know, it was here today, gone by next week. You know, sort of like popular music now. Um, what survives is what people think is good. Never mind, there are a lot of good stuff that falls by the wayside, but the really good stuff will survive. I mean, for every piece that Bach wrote that survived, there are probably a thousand that ought not to have never seen the light of day. And so they justifiably died. And, um, and I have found some pretty awful Baroque pieces in, in archives. And, oh my God, no wonder nobody plays this. It's bloody awful. All right. Um, so um, we're getting into uh, sentimental pieces. Uh, Listen to the Mockingbird dates from the 1840s. It was one of Abraham Lincoln's favorite tunes. But it's all about death. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, it's in two parts. The, uh, the chorus is listen to the Mockingbird. Anyone knows that. But the other part, it's about a girl who doesn't make it. And, and it, it wasn't just a New England thing. I mean, this death cult in music in the 1840s was all over the place. And this song was very emblematic of it. And it was very popular for about 50 years. So, uh, and, um... something I'm going to go into after having taught a Holocaust class. So, um, so that, that was very typical of American modern music. Um, that we had the minstrel shows and their tunes, not all of which could be easily translated to a parlor organ. Um, we had the, uh, the predecessor to Tin Pan Alley, the popular tunes, like uh, the tunes that were, uh, shall we say, teasing the Irish and the blacks and everyone else who didn't quite fit in the Italians and if you didn't fit in, you were going to have something parody written about you. And um, a lot of that, thankfully, did not survive. Excuse my editorial comments. So um, uh, music from other countries, France was a favorite. England was a favorite. Uh, English dance lasted all the way till 1900 uh, in its original form before uh, several revivalists came and messed it up. And I say that directly because I do colonial dance. Modern English dance, you're kind of shuffling around. Where is the exercise? You walk around. Um, you're not, you, okay, you're doing figures. Colonial dance, you got to get up off your heels. You are doing footwork. You are doing Scottish style footwork. And at a colonial dance, if you don't raise a sweat, you're not working hard enough. And I love colonial dance. In fact, I became an avid bicyclist so I could survive a colonial ball in good form. Plus, you're dancing in full guard. And when you're wearing your six-pound frock, you can imagine what kind of weight you're carrying. So, but in, in winter, you want that. So English dance, English tunes, English songs, and some Irish songs were very much in vogue throughout the entire period. Um, like, um,
still danced to in 1880 and danced to nowadays. So, uh, but that's one of the, I, and I think English tunes found their way into the parlor because they were so expressive on melodians. I mean, it just sounds like a big, I mean, I play that, boy, what great 19th century music. Oh, uh, sorry, 17th, but uh, <laughs> the Victorians really love that kind of stuff. Which is good, that's how the English dance music survived. It survived in this country in the parlors on these organs. Even after it was after even after quit people people quit dancing to them. Uh, contra music. Uh, very rarely have ever played on these because it was a little bit too lively. And um, and uh, remind me, uh, Jim, remind me never to complain about having to play the pedal board at St. Paul's <laughs> Um <laughs> This, this is where you got to work. Yeah. So, uh, um, time for me to get back on my bicycle. So, uh, but uh, waltzes. Waltzes were really, really, really big. Uh, this one is the uh, Cohasset Waltz. Um, and the first time I heard it, I saw it mentioned, was on a White House dance program in 1861. Abraham Lincoln danced to this piece. So, um, and it was uh, played by the by a Marine Corps band. No piano, no keyboard. So it was played, and it sounded really odd on those period instruments. But it became very, but it became very, it was already very popular. We do know it was played here because the Union soldiers were sing, forever singing, you know, playing it in their camps. I mean, the Fifth New Hampshire. You you, sit, you look at diaries. The Cohasset was mentioned. So we know it was played here, um, I hope. But would they be playing it there if they hadn't done it here? No, they wouldn't. So I think that matches the date on this instrument perfectly. Now the war years are coming up. All of a sudden, Fort Sumter, after 40 years of making threats, Fort Sumter is fired upon. And secession starts happening, you know, states seceding like dominoes. And um, there was a massive rise in, in nationalistic music on both sides at that time. Hymns also made a big comeback, because you're going to war. I mean, the first thing you do is pray that you come back. And uh, by the way, you had, a, you had a six times chance of being knocked off by disease instead of being knocked off on the battlefield, because hygiene still was non-existent. Uh, it was worse in the South. So um, uh, there were tunes uh, like Just Before the Battle, Mother, uh, but an early one that really made its mark and stayed, and it was also derived from an old Shaker hymn, was Tenting on the Old Campground. Now, I did a program a couple years ago when they rebuilt the organ. I was one of the four musicians invited to, you know, we had four concerts. I was the fourth one. 
I was invited and I said, I would like to do a tie-in between shaker music and the music on the outside. And they went for it. And they said, well, we were hoping you'd do something Mexican. I said, well, the first half will be shaker, second half will be the Mexican Baroque. I think I played the first Mexican Baroque concert ever in Shaker <laughs> Village. I mean, but then how many of those weird guys are you going to find around here, except those of us in Tucson? So Tenting on the Old Campground started out as the untitled Shaker hymn, Now Let Us All Be Blessed. And they um, made some melody changes, but the cadence is still there. And both sides ended up singing it. Home Sweet Home was another one that both sides would sing, often in unison on opposite sides of the river, just before going after each other the next day, just going after each other the next day, but the night before they're singing together. So, um, Incessantly in the camps, and nobody ever got tired of it. It spoke to them. The, the lyrics really spoke to those soldiers out there. It was one of the last songs that Colonel Edward Cross sang the night before he fell on the field at Gettysburg. We have that in. We have that as an account. Uh, Edward Cross. Also, I learned about him when I was in Tucson, because and published a book and was one of and a cohort. And I published a book about him because he ran Arizona's first newspaper in 1858 and 1859 called the Weekly Arizona. His press is still in Tupac. And the Arizona Historical Society is one of his type cases with type in it. This man from New Hampshire came all the way out there, set up a newspaper, Civil War breaks out, he beelines it back to New Hampshire because, because back then Arizona was Confederate control, not for long, but the climate for him. He loved the desert, but the political climate was something, uh, you know, maybe, you, maybe I better go back, get out of here. And he did, and became the colonel of the 5th New Hampshire Regiment and fell at Gettysburg. Uh, you can check out um, Mike Pride's excellent book about him. 
I told you, the first thing I learned, the first thing I did when I moved here was learn about the place I was moving to. I don't like outsiders telling me what's good for my community when you know nothing, nothing about the community. I know that's parochial, but there you have it. So other Civil War songs, I mean, there were, um, uh, oh, the Vicksburg March. Remember Gettysburg? Vicksburg happened concurrently. And Vicksburg fell on July 4th. And those people there, did, it was almost 80 years before Vicksburg, the city of Vicksburg celebrated July 4th again. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would talk about sore losers. I mean, they lost fair and square. Grant just outfoxed them every step of the turn. And General Pemberton didn't know what the hell he was doing. So, and uh, they didn't blame Pemberton. They blamed Grant. So uh, Grant's march is... Uh, was one of those briefly popular tunes, and then it fell out of use. Then it came back during his presidency, after Andrew Johnson, and it was played as part of his inaugural. So, um, wildly was in December 1864. A telegram was received by Abraham Lincoln, a, a Savannah is ours and fairly won. This was the culminating event of Sherman's March to the Sea from Atlanta. And there was a lot of tunes written about that, but the one that is still used, and is, to this day, you cannot play or sing this in certain parts of the South. Um, I haven't. I was warned about that. Don't play this in Upper West Virginia. I mean, West Virginia may be the state that seceded from the state that seceded, so get back into the north, but there is still a lot of southern sentiment there. And so when I teach that, when I was teaching down there, I kind of made it a point to learn the customs of the mores, so um, um, not that they would ever have figured out a Mexican Yankee in the first place, but uh, you don't want to play the wrong stuff at the wrong time. <laughs> So, but um, marching through Georgia, which very quickly became, and still is, a very popular contra dance tune. And, um, but it's all about Sherman's burning his way to the sea. You know, he's going to teach these guys a lesson they're never, they're never going to forget, and truly, they never did. So, uh,
play this in Georgia. <laughs> unless, uh, unless you really want to flaunt your Yankee hood. And um, so, uh, so that, that tune, I mean, quite a few Civil War tunes made into the modern era. That one and Tending on the Old Campground were never, ever lost. They were just simply too, the lyrics were good, the music, at, the music was memorable, and most of all, they were singable. That's the key. And there's a big controversy in church nowadays. Why can't we get people singing the new hymns? And it, came, and it comes up at American Guild of Organists gatherings every time, every single damn time, and I'm getting tired of hearing it. Well, I joined up to be a troublemaker. I said, I hope I won't make you regret bringing, letting this Mexican join, but on the other hand, I'm kind of hoping you do. And so I would listen. I'd just sit there and listen. And then someone would make the mistake of saying, well, we haven't heard from you. And I said, do you really want to? <laughs> I don't know if you really want to or not. Well, we haven't heard from you. You're just sitting there listening. And I said, why do you think I'm sitting here listening? And I'm, pl I'm putting my teacher mode on now. You know, when students get fractious. And um, you just block them at every turn. And they give up and go back to work. Well, okay, I came under pressure. All right. You're wondering why the new hymns are not popular. How many of you have ever tried to sing those things? No hymns? Well, I suggest you go back home and pull the book out and look at it and try to sing it. I mean, and the, you know what? Any hymn that's hard to play is going to be hard to sing. Now, how many of you have played these hymns? Oh, yeah. Are they easy? Not really. <laughs> So if the melody isn't easy on your hands, how do you think it's going to be easy on the untrained musicians in the parish? Mm -hmm. The old hymns are still around, not because of their words, because they were singable, and because they were written by people who knew what the hell they were doing, and who were written by professional musicians who knew they were writing for non-professional singers. Mm -hmm. That's why they're still here. So Brian Wren cannot write a hymn to save his soul. He writes singer-songwriter stuff that even choirs won't touch. So I'm not saying this because I'm conservative, because I'm not. I'm saying this because it's just simple. I mean, you get a... I mean, the troublemakers are all in the choir. They're not in the pews. You're, what you're left with out there are the people who come in in hopes of singing something singable. And if you don't give it to them, you're going to hear about it. So, and, so a lot of Civil War stuff fell in the same category. A lot of it is not heard because it's difficult to both play and sing. But Sherman's March, Grant's March, just before the battle, um, tending on the old campground, they came out of hymns. You can't tell me that Isaac Watts didn't know what he was doing. And shape note tunes got their rise here in New England as well. Isaac Watts, Joseph Broom, uh, Alex Brummerfeld. New Hampshire, province of Maine and Vermont. That's where it got its rise, and the Southerners latched onto it. But shape note music got its rise here. Um, actually, there are quite a few hymns that derive. This is one called Amsterdam. It's a shape note hymn. It never made its way to the hymn book, but I'm waiting for the day that it does. <laughs>
I had a long day, too. <laughs> Um, I only had two classes to teach, but it was a long day. Yes. I was wondering, um, was it the culture back then for, for pianos as, or for organs as well as pianos for young women to learn? Uh, yes, women were the prime for some reason. Well, we know the reason. Women were the prime musicians, but the professionals were dominated by men. Okay. I mean, I don't know of any women organists holding position in the conquered churches yeah. in the 19th century. That had to wait. Okay, well, the Shakers started. Well, they were discounted anyway. <laughs> and, um, I mean, they were found that the Shakers was founded by a woman mm -hmm. and it had equality of women and men. It sowed the seeds of its own destruction by, and I put it bluntly, by insisting on celibacy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but in the mainline churches, it wasn't until the 20th century that women started moving into the benches and becoming choir masters in the bargain. So, um, yeah, the ones who are participating most in the church churches are getting the least jobs. And that had to change. And then uh, you can imagine the controversy when, uh, or controversy as the English say, when the congregational churches started donating women. The Episcopalians got the word in the 1970s. <laughs> and uh, Unitarians never lost it. And Quakers, again, would you, do, would you do that last shaker song for, for the, us? The last shaker song? Yeah, the, I just forgot the Simple name. Simple gifts. Simple gifts? Would you do that for us? I can do that. Wouldn't that be a good way yeah. to end? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I don't want it to end. Oh, yeah. I understand. Stick around. <laughs> yeah, so, um, okay. Well, Simple Gifts. I mean, I love the hymn. Um, it's just that it has become over. I mean, it's overused in popular culture. It needs to be sung more in the churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, it doesn't belong solely in the churches. It's, a, it's public music. The Shakers sang, I mean, their intent was the public gets in on this. And however, it's, it's, it's an ensemble piece. It's a folk piece, which is actually how it started and where it should stay. But it's not being sung enough by what I would call the more appropriate groups who really need to sing it. So pressure your ministers. Um, you oh, might not, you know, it was recently John Griffiths, our executive director, mm -hmm. passed away. Yeah. And that was one of the very songs they sang. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't know. I think it came, I think this song came from the New York area, the, the New York State area. It did not come from Canterbury, and it's not in the it's not in the Shaker Canterbury hymn book. I looked. And, but everything else is in there, including the song from which, the hymn from which um, Tempting came out. And I'll just play part of that, uh, just to show you. while they were singing. Uh, quite a few Shaker tunes found their way into the country dance repertory. And it's still there. Simple Gifts, again, is one of them. And um, so... Uh, okay.
Quaker community version. It sounds slightly different from what we're used to. They did change the chords. It's written in, it was originally laid out in a more classic manner, which means that I would put that tune around 1830. Is there anything that you wanted to do that you haven't had a chance? No. Not that I can think of. Oh, but I think we're wearing him out. That's oh, well, no. but, uh, I mean, I could go on all night. So I don't, know. Don't tempt me. Where did you put the... Never mind. <laughs> if, you're looking Folks, for, if you're looking for the bottle of spirits, the, the so I don't it, partake. It would be hard cider. I mean, hmm. be more appropriate. I mean, uh, communion almost sends me into... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good lesson to be learned. Question. Where yeah. was this Prescott organ kept? I mean, where was it when it's not here, or, or is it here all the time? Help me. Well, it was in this building, but it was a gift to us in the past couple of years. Oh, it and is owned by the Covenant one. Historical Society. We do not keep it out where it's played, but it is kept upstairs. So I stressed for days thinking about it moving, <clears throat> and especially the unmovable um, bellow yeah. at the bottom, oh, because the, it, uh, it does not fold up and fearful of bringing it down the stairs that it would catch on the carpet, fall down the stairs, it was terrible. Oh. Do you know the oh, yeah. So I really appreciate well, bringing this down, taking, uh, this was taking that risk. Mm -hmm. no. it, it we was have a, a second one under the stairs, mm -hmm. but it needs to be prepared, uh, repaired. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely donation done. <laughs> 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 they're, not, they're not cheap, no, yeah. it's a fix. Uh, yeah. By the way, I also bought the big Concord book. Thank you, we oh, appreciate yes. that. And, um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big I've always been a big believer in supporting your local society. I'm very locally oriented. I don't shop at franchises. <laughs> I mean, I can find what I want at Rocky's Ace or Aubuchon before it closed. I mean, the local art stores, the local markets, um, you know, lo I mean, the more local, the better. And, um, and, yeah, I, and I picked up my parochial attitude by growing up in a barrio. I mean, where compras tu en locales or else. I mean, a suerte. I mean, you buy local or else. <laughs> You're not going to support your community. You better get out. And um, and um, so and I I didn't lose that attitude. I, and I somehow managed to fit. Although I do have to say, when I first moved here, I got incessantly for the first few months. That question, are you related to? <laughs> and I would say no, and I had said no about 37,822 times. And finally, Alice gave me the idea, and I sprang it on ex-Senator John P. H. Chandler, who came up to me, and he was pretty obnoxious about it, so I decided, okay, my Mexican attitude has been risen and I'm going to take it out on him. I won't pull an obsidian knife, but he's going to get it. <laughs> so, well, you have to be related to Nathan Hale. And I said, not unless he was Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he puffed up like a turkey cock. I mean, tail feathers spread and he's about to sharpen his claws on my chest. And I said, um, you have to understand. Well, and then he said, well, where'd you get a name Hale? <laughs> And I said, well, my name, it's an English name, but it's been a Mexican family name since 1571. Wow. It is pronounced Ale. Okay. And it became, within 20 years of its arrival in Mexico, it became the name of an Aztec family. And we are still here, and I am still one of them, so I'm kind of warning you. <laughs> he backed case. away. And so ever since then, are you related to Nathan? Was he Mexican? <laughs> and then uh, to friends I will say, you know, you have to understand, I mean, Nathan was a great figure. But I asked my Marine Corps father what it would have been like if he'd been Mexican. He said, you want the Marine answer? I said, of course I want the Marine answer. That's why I'm asking a Marine captain. Well, you know, man, you went into full dialect. If Natan had been Mexicano, first off, he wouldn't have gotten drunk in a bar full of redcoats. <laughs> Second, segundo, if he'd been Mexican, they'd have never caught him. <laughs> so, uh, end of story, right? Right. Yeah. And uh, so I've, I've not gotten the question in a while. I think the word is out. Uh, yeah, you better leave him alone on that one. Then. Wow. So the Prescott Morgan 
um, oddly, right after COVID, mm -hmm. we received a letter from a family in Gilmanton that they had one and they wanted to give it as a contribution to the Concord Historical Society. We didn't have one in our possession, so we were very eager to take it. Um, Mark Cohen with Page Belting Company took his little company truck up on a nice weather day and transported it back here. And then within two months, we got the second one. And uh, so we literally went post-pandemic, no, um, no Prescott organs to having two. That's great. And it doesn't fit in the donation jar, but that doesn't mean we wouldn't take it. <laughs> and I want to thank the Concord Historical Society and Kimball Jenkins for inviting me here and letting me play another historic instrument. Oh, thank you. So a, lot of, a lot of advantage to being a historic musician, you get invited to play, I mean, I mean, I've played organs in Mexico that weren't touched, you know, they're you're not allowed to even look at, and oh, yeah. I'm see, go to the old, hey, come here, I've got to show you something. Mm -hmm. And um, they always want to show you what they've got. And then, then mm -hmm. because you, because I look interested, because I am, I'm kind of itching to get my hands on it. <laughs> hey, maybe you should try playing this. We were mm -hmm. commenting that the Kibble family could have had one of these in their houses. Very likely. Because, yeah. you know, the house itself was constructed in 1877 and, and they had the, in 1882. They had the status. They had the status to have had this in the house. Mm -hmm. And you and can it. almost imagine people dancing in the rooms here while you were playing. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the ghosts weren't doing right? just that. <laughs> That's why we're in the parlor. We're in the parlor. Yeah. Where's the <laughs> Second Thursday, next month, you'll be here. Oh, we'll be next door. Excuse me. Oh. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Oh, I got the plan in a classy location. Yes. yes. I mean, well, the carriage house is really classy, but I mean, I'm surrounded by all this wood. Yeah. Uh, it's going to, right now, it's a surprise. We've got something going on, and we haven't got a confirmation, so I'm not announcing it. I was joking with Jim. We need to just start doing it's called History Out of a Hat. We're going to have a hat. We'll draw the topic that night. And it'll be fun. It'll be like Jeopardy. We'll see how it goes. How many of you are from Concord? Oh, well. And any, uh, well, I meant to say family history from Concord. None. Because there, I know this young lady does, is, and as I am. Uh, but it would be a fascinating night sometime to invite all the old timers, sort of, and have others too. But here are some of the questions about uh, why Concord is today the way it is. And uh, for a quick example, the red brick downtown that we have, which is, in my opinion, absolutely beautiful. That didn't just happen. That was a lot of work. And it was about 1975 or so when the, when the city started talking about improving and holding together a red brick downtown. And then later on there was a program, uh, uh, Mayor Verano put together the 2020 program that he mm -hmm. had come across when he had gone to a national convention. And so there was a whole group of people that got together looking forward to what Concord would look like in 2020. And this just didn't fall out of the sky. There was a lot of hard work a lot of tears, mm -hmm. but a lot of effort to make it happen, and people today are most pleased. I am, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to have some of the newer folks come and say, well, this, you know, how did this happen, or mm -hmm. why did it happen? Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy, but here we are. You're looking mm -hmm. at evolution. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.